Okay, good afternoon. Good. Great to see everybody here. Um, great to be back. Uh, so, to kick things off, <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Senate President, uh, to the honorable members of the House and the Senate, uh, the executive council members that are joining us today, our illustrious commissioners, and of course, uh, the members of the Supreme Court. Uh, all very exciting. Thank you guys for joining us, and obviously all the citizens that are joining us both in chambers and on television today, welcome. Uh, I was reminded earlier this week that this was my final State of the State address. I don't know if that was said in with sadness or excitement, I can't tell. <laughs> Fourth term, don't care. Um, <laughs> hey, although the filing period to run isn't in until June, so you never know. Just, just kidding. Councillor Warmington just almost fell out of her chair right there. <laughs> just kidding, Cindy. You're good. Uh, no, as they say, eight is enough, right? Uh, so in that spirit, I will do my best to be brief, but you know me, I tend to ramble a little bit. Um, so as always, I really do enjoy taking this opportunity uh, to uh, really be proud uh, of the many accomplishments that our state, its citizens, and, its co and our communities have delivered. Uh, I think today you're gonna hear many proud data points and proud rankings that we have achieved together. <clears throat> but through all those accolades, uh, let us not forget that while immense progress has been made in areas like mental health, education, the opioid uh, pandemic, uh, we mustn't be blind to the many families and citizens of our great state still waiting for services or struggling to meet ends meet, struggling to make ends meet. Let us not forget that one of our fellow state employees went to work in November, but he never got to come home to his family because he gave his life protecting those around him at New Hampshire Hospital. Chief Bradley Haas was a true hero. We will never forget him and will never stop being grateful for his bravery. Our pats on the back today, so to say, they're, they're not going to bring Bradley back. They also won't bring opportunities to families any faster, but my hope is that it will give them confidence that New Hampshire has the right approach and the attention to individuals. We're always willing to go the extra mile to be innovative in providing opportunities to everyone. So let's start with everyone's favorite topic, politics. He said to a room of politicians. So less than a month ago, uh, our nation once again turned its eyes towards New Hampshire. Just as we have for the last hundred years, we hosted the first in the nation presidential primary. Now our place at the front of the nomination calendar is never a given. It is always fought for, earned, and won. We take our responsibility of getting the process right. Uh, we take it very serious, and this year was no exception. Candidates can come here with little money or no name ID. They can campaign the New Hampshire way by going door to door, town hall to town hall, living room to living room, taking every question and being accountable to the voters, not just party bosses down in Washington. And I would like to extend a great, uh, a great debt of gratitude to the work of Secretary of State Dave Scanlon, his team, and the countless city and town election officials, uh, many of which are volunteers, by the way, that really made sure that this went off without a hitch. We all thank you, really. Oh, there he is. So New Hampshire was a banner, uh, 2023 was a banner year for New Hampshire. Uh, we had opportunities and we achieved an advancing freedom. We increased uh, opportunities in our economies. We put our families first. And now you may have heard some of these data points before, because I do like to brag about them in, in other speeches. But in just the last year, New Hampshire was ranked the number one state for overall freedom, the number one state for economic freedom, the number one state for child well-being, and we will continue working to ensure that we maintain the lowest poverty rate in the country. Great job. Really great job. So those are some of the big headline ones. Some folks may have seen those before, but there are a few rankings that maybe went under the radar, but I do want to acknowledge. Did you know that this past year, for the first time ever, our correction system was ranked the best in the country? So hats off to Commissioner Hanks. <clears throat> great job. Or did you know that New Hampshire was the first state in the nation with a nationally approved cybersecurity plan 
Uh, nothing, uh, not an easy task and something that is on the forefront of everything we do in our days. So again, great job to Commissioner Dennis Goulet. New Hampshire is now ranked as the best return on investment for taxpayers. Number one, I like to call that the Efficient Government Award. So again, living a, to a gold standard for the rest of the country. Here's one. New Hampshire, in two separate reports, New Hampshire is now ranked as having both the smartest and one of the most productive workforces in the country. A real testament to our citizens. And that is a big part of why businesses are coming here from all over the country. And I would be remiss, I don't know, I'd be remiss, I'm looking for him somewhere, uh, if I didn't give a little shout out to Commissioner Bill Cass and his amazing team at the Department of Transportation. Uh, not only are they doing a great job plowing our road, well, this year they're getting off a little easy on the plowing the roads, and they are great, don't get me wrong, they're great. Mother Nature's been very kind. But again, for the first time ever, uh, New Hampshire has been listed in one of the reports as having the best roads in America. So great job, Bill. I don't, I don't think it means we don't have any potholes, but ours, I guess, are more pleasant than most. I don't know. Um, so look, we could keep going on with a lot of these accolades, but uh, we, we would be here all day. Um, I know you're all getting anxious to get back to work. Um, so we don't want to take the successes for granted, right? Because continued success is not inevitable. We must continually challenge ourselves, putting individuals before the system to strive to be better stewards of taxpayer dollars and more accountable to the people of the state. Being the best is earned, it is not given, and that is what has guided us this last seven years, and that is what will take us into more successes into the future. So I still believe with all these great rankings, one of the greatest achievements, and I really believe this uh, sincerely, one of the greatest achievements that we have had and conquered was the passage of last year's bipartisan, balanced budget with an evenly divided legislature on a, on a voice vote. And that is just an amazing testament to this body, to the folks that work tirelessly in the State House. Um, uh, it didn't come with any gimmicks or empty promises. It was achieved with a lot of hard work. And so that is my personal thanks on behalf of the 1.4 million constituents of this state to say again, thank you, great job, w job well done. <clears throat> and that wasn't any small budget. There is a lot to be proud of that you guys were able to achieve in that budget. It ensured an eighth straight year in New Hampshire with no new taxes, the full elimination of the interest and dividends tax, Historic increases, historic increases in Medicaid rates to help retain our healthcare workforce on across the board pay raise. Again, historic pay raise for our uh, vital state employees at 12%. We cut red tape. We simplified the professional licensure process for so many of our citizens across the state. You added $50 million uh, to promote and achieve housing, more housing development, which we know is one of the number one issues uh, across New Hampshire. And the one I love the most, uh, after decades of inaction, we reconstructed the education funding formula, ensuring efficiency, fairness, and adding hundreds of millions of dollars for the students of the state. It, it is a really an, an amazing job. <laughs> New Hampshire leads from the front. We do not follow. That has uh, been tried and true for a couple hundred years now. So every policy victory, every economic win, and record-breaking statistic has been the direct result of that hard work, fiscal discipline, sound government stewardship, and we should all be proud. And that, in itself, is the New Hampshire success story. Today, New Hampshire is more prosperous than ever. Our economy was ranked as the fastest growing in the country last year at 8.1%, becoming the envy of the nation and the best place in America to live, work, and raise a family. Businesses are moving here in droves. After years of more people leaving the state, I think through 20, 2015, we had something like six straight years of more people leaving the state than moving in. Since 2015, we've had a surge of domestic migration into New Hampshire, resulting more in more people working than ever before. Nearly 40,000 more people are working in New Hampshire today than when I first took office, and our unemployment rate continues to be one of the lowest in the nation. But if you are out there, and I'm sure there are folks listening out there today that for whatever reason, they could be having trouble finding a job that's right for them or their family, I really encourage folks sincerely to contact the Department of Employment Security. Uh, you know we have a great commissioner over there, Commissioner Capatis. I know this, hey George, you here? Where's George? He's in the back, smiling with that funky mustache as always. <laughs> you know, if you don't know, George is a Cowboys fan, 
so he kind of lives in perpetual misery. Um, <laughs> but he takes amazing pride and amazing joy and happiness in working with individuals, finding them a job, finding the best career path for their family. So if anyone is struggling, give George and his team a call, and I really mean that sincerely. They do an amazing job. We have 10, over 10,000 great available jobs today, and we want folks to find the path that best fits them and their family. So definitely reach out. Um, congratulations, Commissioner Kratis. In all sincerity, your team has done a tremendous, tremendous job. <clears throat> So with all these successes, obviously they come challenges as well, there's no doubt about it. Businesses cannot be successful without workforce, and there won't be a workforce unless we have the housing. This is something we've really felt the burden of all across the country, but here in New Hampshire is no exception, uh, for the past couple of years. Families and work workers are the backbone of a strong, thriving state, and without housing, our economic opportunity suffers. Which is why, with your support, we are able to launch our Invest New Hampshire, Invest NH Housing Fund, a first of its kind fund to incentivize the construction of new housing projects. This was just a couple years ago, and the goal was to get permits out and houses up. Then the initial results are in in this past month, and it has been an immediate success. Since launching the program two short years ago, the total number of permits issued for residential construction has doubled our expectations in just this past year. More permits issued in more than a decade, and we're now on track to bring thousands of new units online by all through 2024. So already we have, uh, under the Invest in H Fund, we have housing developments that have been completed in Concord, in Conway, Manchester, Lebanon, Littleton. Um, almost all of which is workforce housing, which is exactly what the states need. It's a win for New Hampshire, and again, I thank the legislature for making it all happen. So let's take a step back a little bit, and we can discuss some of our landmark strides in, uh, in the few years surrounding opportunities around kids and education, obviously a paramount discussion that we continually have in Concord. Now, we can go back to the days when the balance uh, of our education trust fund was negative by about $52 million. And if you were in the four walls of that traditional classroom and it wasn't working for your kid, you were stuck. You were out of luck. But that is not where we are today. Not anymore. Next year, the education surplus is expected to reach over $230 million. And families are singing the praises of the work done right here in Concord for finally passing the Education Freedom Accounts, which are now ranked as the most effective and popular school choice program in America. And And why passing HB 1665 to expand this opportunity for our families is so vitally important. Let's get that done. And today, understand that today, our public schools are ranked number two in the country. We have amazing public schools here in New Hampshire. We have amazing teachers doing amazing work with our kids. We now spend more dollars per child than ever before in public education. All factors that allow kids to maximize their potential. Through the past few years, we've instilled full day kindergarten, a huge win. The Learn Everywhere program, allowing flexibility for kids to get credits outside of the classroom. New Hampshire Career Academies, where you can actually, at no cost to the individual or the state, you can actually get your associate's degree for free as a high school student. Amazing opportunities that didn't exist just a few years ago. Uh, the one I'm most proud of and, and very excited about is this year we have kind of our first of its kind robotics fund. It sparks individual opportunities for kids in the area of STEM. And I'm going to take a quick moment. Uh, this, this is a quick story that happened just last week. We became the first state where I said, look, we're going to put a robot in every classroom, right? People said, well, that's crazy. How are you going to do it? And you did it. You really did. But here's the interesting part. We didn't just say we're going to put robots in every classroom and allow this opportunity, buy some robots, and ship them to the schools. That's not what we did at all. Um, the, the new First Robotics XRP robots, they're now shipping out. But this is the way they did it, which I thought was really cool. We're, the students are making the robots, not assembling them. They literally are building them in the 3D uh, print farms, right? So the students are kind of vertically integrating what they're doing. They're building the parts to the robot. They're getting involved with supply chain and manufacturing. They're putting them in their packages. 
This is a combination of high school students working with the community colleges, and then they send them to other students in the state to learn how to use them. Well, at the same time, the teachers have a free opportunity to take classes to learn how to teach to them. And at the same time, you all passed an opportunity to give incentive bonuses to any school teacher in the state that wants to become a computer science teacher. It's so vertically integrated, but I'm telling you, what you guys did is amazing. This is the future. It's opening up all these opportunities of technology, not just for a few students, but for every student. And not just for a few teachers, but for every teacher, for everyone to participate in that opportunity. This is where workforce is going. This is the opportunity that we can give kids for real world skills. Um, and again, not just in their senior or junior year, but up and down for every single classroom. So I thought that was an amazing uh, program. Dean came in and, and his folks are working again in conjunction with the community colleges and the, and the high schools. Um, when I went to this 3D print farm and there were literally like, you know, 40 different printers printing these pieces, um, really taking it from the supply chain all the way to seeing a kid in that classroom using that, that device. I thought it was an amazing example of making sure that kids have an experiential, something learning and experiential at every step of the process. It was great. Now there's one more aspect of education I do want to uh, touch upon. Earlier this year, um, I created a special task force to look at uh, kind of a new 21st century model for post-secondary education. Uh, I've asked the community colleges and the university systems, some folks in the business world, some, some folks in the public sector, uh, to really consider where the models for these opportunities are headed. It is changing drastically. When you become 17, 18 years old, it isn't just we're going to apply to some schools and go. There's so many, there's such a host of opportunities, especially in this post-pandemic world. More online opportunities, whatever it might be. So we've really challenged them to look at what's happening. Uh, throughout that process and make sure that we're staying ahead of that curve and if we don't if we just kind of whistle past the graveyard we're going to see declining enrollments and we'll really be scrambling in a crisis now at the same time i do want to i'd be remiss if i didn't give out a, a shout out and a thank you uh university of new hampshire uh is uh, we have a great president in james dean i think he's done a fantastic job over there he is retiring so we'll be bringing somebody in uh, new on that level so that's we thank jim for uh, james for his service uh, but there's opportunity there as well, and it's not just combining the systems of what it might be, but really making sure we're looking at those college and community college opportunities from the customer perspective. I'm passionate about it because I'm starting to tour colleges with my own daughter, right, and try to, try to see what, what her is. And so as a, as a constituent, as, as a consumer, if you will, we're going through this as a family in terms of what all the options are. Uh, the traditional models of college and, and community college don't work for everyone anymore, but I think if we stay ahead of it, we've, I think we have a, a great opportunity with this task force, and I'm excited to see uh, what, they'll, what they'll be bringing us to ensure that New Hampshire remains competitive. Um, and while I'm on the subject of, of colleges and post-secondary education, you know, one of the, or one of the institutions uh, I, we don't often recognize uh, here in Concord, uh, they're a private institution, but a great institution, is the great work done by Dartmouth College. So let's take a little bit of a step back. We have seen all across the country a lot of this growing hateful anti-Semitic anti rhetoric across some of America's great college campuses. And frankly, I, I personally think that the actions of many of the Ivy League schools in America as it pertains to this crisis, I think it's been terrible. I've even called for some of the presidents of the Ivy Leagues to resign. But I want to very much applaud the efforts of President C.N. Belock, uh, the new president over at Dartmouth. In just her first year, she has set Dartmouth apart and led as an example of ensuring free, speak, free speech and respect on campus. Uh, and guess what? I mean, she used the situation to bring students together and make sure it was an educational process, an educational forum to learn on this issue. And those students have very much responded in kind. The rest of the Ivy League schools are now looking as, at Dartmouth as the example to follow. And I just want to take the opportunity to thank her and her team for representing New Hampshire so well. Changing gears a little bit, you know, I go back to when I first got elected, even during the campaign, uh, one thing I said a lot was that mental health, mental health was the unspoken crisis of the time. It was ignored, the system was absolutely fractured. But with a lot of the new funding that this legislature has moved forward, the revamped programs, an emphasis on prioritizing people over bureaucracy, we have turned the tide. Now we're finally giving families a sense that in their toughest times, there is a system that can be focused on some better solutions. Thousands of New Hampshire families today 
are struggling with mental health issues in a variety of forms. So why is there good cause for hope, knowing that you have, can have so many families out there struggling with this in all these different ways? Well, let's take, again, a step back. Just a few years ago, we challenged ourselves with a bold 10-year mental health plan, and it was bold. It was stakeholder-driven. We didn't have bureaucrats write it. We went out and talked to the families. We talked to the students. We talked to the kids. We found out where the system had been failing them and then challenged ourselves to go after a lot of those barriers. And this legislature has been aggressive in taking on all those recommendations. Now, we kept that momentum going. Just last summer, the Department of Health and Human Services launched what we call Mission Zero, building on years of progress with the goal of eliminating emergency department boarding once and for all. And we're backing that mission up with historic investments. You, a lot of you have seen this out there. New Hampshire has financed a public-private partnership with Solutions Health for a brand new state-of-the-art mental health hospital. We purchased Hampstead Hospital for children with acute mental illness. We are in the process of in almost done reconstructing the wing, the new wings over at New Hampshire Hospital uh, that will add new beds slated to open in just a couple months. And we're building the brand new forensic hospital slated to open next year. All huge capital investments with the goal of getting citizens out of emergency rooms and into the best care facilities possible. And our community investments, so critical. The best care is always in the community when you can do it. They are having tremendous success at, uh, as well. Last year, over 5,000 children were served through the rapid response crisis services. Over 2,000 received assistance from our mobile response teams. We've increased mental health supported housing by 61%. We have a new crisis stabilization centers, moving patients away from the emergency rooms. Those are opening up. And when it comes to youth detention, New Hampshire now has the lowest rate in the country. So there's a lot of work ahead of us, but these transformational changes have opened doors like never before and given families choices when their kids need it the most. And remember, if you're out there and you're watching, uh, if you uh, are a family or an individual in crisis, we remind ourselves all the time, you can always call 211 at any time to be connected to an expert uh, uh, with caring technical expertise for help and assistance. And unfortunately, too often our mental health efforts become, become tied in to the opioid and fentanyl crisis. It continues to affect every community, not only in New Hampshire, but really across the country. Now, thanks to our very successful doorway program that we implemented back in 2019, New Hampshire citizens have access to wraparound services and options of care across the state. The New Hampshire, we, in New Hampshire, we created our recovery-friendly workplace program, which has now gone national. We, we're all very proud of that, allowing nearly 100,000 citizens right here in New Hampshire to now work for a recovery-friendly workplace. New Hampshire is now butch bucking the unfortunate national trend of skyrocketing overdose deaths. If you've seen some of the data that is coming out as we close out 23, the rest of the country since 2018, the rest of the country is up almost 60% in overdose drug deaths since 2018. Our numbers have actually gone down. We've had a lot of success there, but that is no solace, no solace to the approximately 400 plus families that will lose a loved one right here in New Hampshire. 400 families are going to lose someone to that drug crisis likely in the coming year. So we know that more always has to be done. And we know where it's coming from. The fentanyl supply over America's southern border is increasing daily over the past few years. Records amount of fentanyl being smuggled into our system. Millions of illegal migrants not just involved with the human trafficking and the extortion, but with the deadly drug trafficking that is killing New Hampshire citizens. Now last year we had about just, just shy of 200 of our brave men and women in our National Guard, those soldiers successfully assisted on the southern border down in McKellen, Texas. They just came back just a couple months ago. And we thank them for their service and their duty to the country. Tomorrow I will go to the legislature and request funds for additional National Guard to join other states across the country down at Eagle Pass, Texas, where some of the highest incidents of illegal crossings and drug smuggling have occurred. This is not a Texas problem. This is a national crisis. And New Hampshire has the chance to provide specialized support, follow the laws of the land, and keep our citizens safe. Let's do this. And when we talk about our brave men and women in service to our country, let's not forget the great work New Hampshire is doing to help our veterans. 
I, my goal has always been to be the number one state for veteran services. And I thank the legislature for their efforts creating our new first of its kind New Hampshire Military Veterans Campus, which is currently under construction up in Franklin, New Hampshire. Uh, it, it's under construction today and will be accepting its first veterans in 2025, whether it be homelessness, recovery, mental, uh, mental health services. Led by Maureen Borgard and her great team over at Easter Seals, it is going to be a gold standard for veterans care. I won't be governor, but you got to invite me to that ribbon cutting. I just want to see the place up and running. It's going to be great. So look, there's no doubt about it. Times in New Hampshire are good. Good management, fiscal prudence, and a limited government worldview guide our decision making. Over these last seven years, New Hampshire has stood out as a beacon of success and a safe haven for freedom and opportunity. We have all put in the hard work, and this, is what a true, this has always been a true team effort. We fought for lower taxes, and it worked. We fought for more efficient government, and it worked. We fought for local control and decentralized government. It worked. We fought for the rights of the individual, putting them before government, and it worked. When we had one-time funds come in, instead of growing government or instituting massive new programs, we focused on one-time projects. Instead of a governing with a one-size-fits-all approach out of Concord, we engage stakeholders. We engage those local officials and those families, shifting decision-making in government to those constituents on the front lines. So if I have one message to leave for this le legislature, it is this. You cannot take our amazing success for granted. Fiscal prudence definitely rules the day. Understand that for the average citizen out there, personal debt it is at an all-time high. Inflation has skyrocketed across costs across to everyday Americans by over 20% in just a few years. Many New Hampshire families are struggling because of the, just something as simple as high prices at the grocery store. And these challenges are offered beyond our control, so now more than ever, it's, more, it's important that we continue to minimize the state's burden on taxpayers, ensure that the services we provide focus on serving that individual and not just the system. Responsible management of taxpayer dollars will be of the utmost importance. If a recession hits, and I'm still a little concerned a recession across this country very much could hit, it is our job as leaders to make sure that we're the last state to hit into the recession and the first state to get out. But that requires restraint. We are strategic in New Hampshire. We plan. We don't believe in just that, okay, government's going to get it done. We do empower that private sector to be partners in our success. Next year, there'll be a new governor and a new legislature and new challenges to address. Oh, we got to cheer for that one. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> but look, we are so much better off when we are working together. And it's up to each of you that return next year to bring that same level of energy, cooperativeness, and bipartisanship that has helped us achieve so much together. New Hampshire truly has set a gold standard. Now, I'm not going in any, anywhere, any, anywhere anytime soon. Don't get too excited. You can keep the cheers for another 10 months. So let's keep working hard. Let's keep doing it as a team. We can have our differences in the political divide. That's OK. But at the end of the day, we have a great record over these past few years of really outshining the rest of the country, working together, finding solutions, and getting stuff done. I just want to thank all of you. God bless you. God bless the great state of New Hampshire. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you.